15 minutes. Uh, break. Break. Oh, 20. Right. I'm happy with that. Eric, you're the major knee. <laughs> <laughs> you're perfect. Um, so, I, I, it's, oh my God, it's just a board of force. But I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm uh, uh, about two thirds of the way through the talk, I realized there was just something in the back of my mind that, that was buzzing and buzzing that was, you were, it was, you were, was, I was being reminded of something. And finally, it was Maxwell, Matter in Motion where Maxwell discusses uh, uh, the basis for applying the third law to, um, to, to action at a distance. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can... By the way, that's written after the sequence of Cavendish experiments. Okay. Speaking. Right. And so I, 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 I was actually going to ask if you knew whether uh, Maxwell knew about this, because I, I have no clue. But I, I, knew, I know that Maxwell, yeah, it was written in, I think, what, 1870 or something? Um, yeah, so, it's, so, in, it's in the early 1870s. So and I they was, started in 1840, and they're being done right. in France and Britain, and then in Germany. So, uh, so uh, that the, uh, that was actually the second part of my question: is Do you know? Did Maxwell know about this stuff? I don't. Know. But but the uh, the first part of the first the first part of the question was: Do you? I mean, so that, there Maxwell says that the application of the third law to port the action at a distance is a deduction from the first law. And it, I mean, it seems like you're you're telling a, quite a different story here. And well, indirectly it is if you accept the center of gravity principle, because mm -hmm. the center, if, if the center of gravity can't gain motion from the interaction mm -hmm. of bodies, then of course the third law needs to apply. Right. But of course, saying the center of gravity is not gaining motion in our planetary system mm -hmm. in 1687 was as much as speculation. Said we couldn't even figure out where the center of gravity was at the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but on the Maxwell question, Pointing was close to him. Pointing did one of the most important of these experiments. I think it's up there. Mm -hmm. And Pointing, a little after, I think it's after Maxwell died, but not long, wrote a whole book on the whole collection of these experiments. <coughs> I happen to be, I can't remember. Now, that's the, the tables from the Zenic article. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'll, I, this is, I give a version of this talk to fit when I'm asked to speak before physicists. Uh, and the way I do it is I start off with the point that no phenomenon of, in any system, no phenomenon of motion can possibly show you what the inertial mass of any body is. And I intend for resistance. And then I get a 10 minute argument. The one in Texas, I had about 200 people in the audience and it was getting rabid. And then my host, Steve Weinberg says, he's right about this, let's go on. <laughs> but then the point, the point I really wanted to make, the point I really wanted to make is I tell the story first of the figure of the Earth, and then of these experiments in much more detail than I had here. And then I tell the bit about Chris, and say, I thought I was a philosopher, was smart enough to have discovered this, when in fact it shows up in the physics literature exactly where it should, in a review article, a careful review article, and then smiles at the physics. <laughs> so I thought you would enjoy that, Chris. Yeah, so uh, so much to, to ask about, but it's terrific. The one thing that I think is uh, just, first of all, a kind of interesting comparison, the only project that comes to mind to me that has a similar flavor is the huge reconstruction effort that people have put into like Einstein's Zurich Notebook, in the sense that you have one person who's making such a huge amount of progress in a short amount of time, and you can reconstruct the conceptual evolution of basically gravitational physics by looking at the manuscript trail of one person. And so the... Do you understand I gave you about one fifth uh, I'm sure, of the... I'm yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. But I think that, so... Uh, the Einstein comparison I bring up because uh, sort of at the, at the top level, one thing that people were asking about the work Einstein was doing was what were the main conceptual obstacles he was facing and what resources did he have uh, at his, you know, that he could use to overcome those. And I guess uh, what I wanted to ask a little bit more about in your talk is the, how do you uh, develop this conception of a force of nature, right? So you've emphasized that the question of thinking of it as a mutual interaction is key. The thing that I was most struck by is the fact that it's also a compositional force, the, the force on the entire body, this is what you're coming to right at the end. But then there's also a question of what properties of a body is a force allowed to vary on. And I'm asking this because 
of course, is thinking that there would be other forces of nature other than just gravity. Do you have any evidence from Liber Secundus about uh, that kind of, you know, in the Principia, he's very explicit that gravity is just one example of a force. Is there anything at this stage where he's considering other forces and... Well, it, consistently in Liber Secundus, when he gets to the point that he knows he hasn't got an adequate argument for a claim about gravity, he appeals to magnets. Hmm. Right, okay. so he's considering magnetic forces. That's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, think of the historical context. Nobody thought terrestrial gravity was interactive. Hmm. I mean, think of the preposterousness. The right, Earth's right. being drawn toward me. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I mean, this is a wild thought. Mm -hmm. But you have one example of interaction, but nobody had actually looked at that except mathematically for perfectly elastic bodies. Mm -hmm. And fairly crude pendulum experiments to show it's not falsified that those results. Mm -hmm. So he's coming together here first with the third law of motion being something much more correct and precise mm -hmm. than anybody, or and therefore conservation of momentum, right. et cetera, than anybody has seen, it, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, he's deciding gravity should be like impact, and magnetic force should be like impact. In fact, right. all real forces right. should be like impact. Okay? And that's happening here. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can say about what's driving him is what I proposed at the end. You know Einstein better than I do. Mm -hmm. He found the fact that gravity proportions itself to the body it acts on. Mm -hmm. Weird. Mm -hmm. Strange. And we remember on the first slide, he expressly says, this is not true of magnetic force. Mm -hmm. It's a corollary to Proposition 6. This is not true of magnetic force. Right. So he's recognized there's something extraordinary about gravity. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is, trying to accommodate the very idea of how an external force can right. adjust itself to different bodies gets accommodated by saying it's not really external in the sense we think of it. Right. And that that's the conceptual. But, you know, I'm partly filling in. All I have is what I presented to you. Right. No, it's, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to follow up, actually, on the forces talk, where if he likes that impact is uh, equal and opposite, and he sees that magnetism is like that, and I buy that he demonstrates that gravity works like that, is it then a metaphysical principle that he would say, okay, this is a property of forces in general, sort of the way Stein characterizes it? Or is that, like, if you were to introduce a new force to Newton, presumably he would think, oh, yes, there's going to be something equal and opposite in how it's working, but does he have any evidence for that, or does he just have three cases and a metaphysical postulate that it Well, he doesn't quite say it as a metaphysical postulate. I re as I recall, the last sentence in the paragraph in the uh, preface to the first edition says this conception is going to hold for gravity, maybe this way of philosophizing will cover it. Yes. That's the only even allusion to this anywhere in the Principia. But the maybe this way of philosophizing could mean this third law, or it could mean this, try the third law and then verify it through checking. Well, the way I read him is concluding here, and this is now Howard's influence on me, of course Howard's phrase is forces of nature, mm -hmm. uh, is that Newton really did come to the conception that if you are not satisfying the third law, it's not a real force. But that's an extraordinary conclusion to reach historically at the time, because nobody had even remotely suggested something like that. I guess that's just what I'm drawn to. So I, I, you know, what I want to say strongly, Howard's right, the law of gravity and this picture of interaction, they had to come together. And I'm suggesting as strongly as I can, namely this weird property of gravity forced it. I am right, am I not? Einstein was rather concerned about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's part of the point I'm making, mm -hmm. namely the, the parallel. Beyond that, you know, we, we have far too little manuscript evidence. We have what we have. I should add, by the way, go back to uh, Eric. Uh, it's a strange thing. Tom Whiteside missequenced some of these documents. And the only grounds I can give is he never looked at the manuscript for Liber Secundus, looked only at the published version, and therefore didn't see the deletions, etc. He never mentions the manuscript anywhere. 
he died, I, you know, last time I talked to him was about three weeks before he died, and I wasn't at this place, it was too many years ago. I wish I knew, but I think the failure to look at the manuscript for Liber Secundus has led to a lot of confusion in 1685, because only the manuscript shows the deletions and insertions, and they can give you a track, as I was trying to demonstrate as part of this talk. Z and Rob? No, I think Z was before, a while ago. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, as usual, amazing. Um, about the Euler quote, um, I'm going to... That's not my translation, that's Eric Forbes. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm still going to assume that uh, Euler is being careful, and that he's saying that no single phenomena that attract the forces of heavenly bodies are proportional to the masses. Is he convinced by geodesy experiment? Well, he's totally convinced. Oh, that's a good question. Because these yeah, are not I'm, I'm, I'm bodies. Gonna these answer, are good. I'm going to yeah, answer that question. It, it's, it's, it's got a wonderful Janus face answer. You look at his equations. This is uh, Euler's. Mm -hmm. GM. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay. Uh -huh. So if, when he writes equations, he's treating the absolute force as GM. Huh. Okay. In the letters to a German princess, he gets to the stuff on the figure of the Earth and the uh, variation of surface gravity and really emphasizes the inconsistency at that time, mm -hmm. concluding this is totally an open question. So I think he's engaged in wishful thinking okay. over that. But it, the, those things didn't fall together. Technically, that began to fall together when Laplace, in volume two of Celestial Mechanics, that's 1799, took all the data from the expeditions up to that point and did it twice, once with the Lapland data in it and once without, and concluded the Lapland data was garbage. It was distorting everything. And for the first time, we got close enough that he, Laplace himself, concludes at the end of volume two, okay, we can accept that it's proportional to the mass of the attractive body. And I think almost all physicists just assumed throughout the 19th century that was true. I don't think they thought there was a problem. And that's why I was struck that Zenik would pick it up. Is Rob next? Or? Just, a, just a minor remark about what you were discussing with Chris a moment ago and what suggested the idea of the forces interaction. And it seems that from the beginning uh, of his speculating that the that gravity extends to the moon, uh, and thinking about it in connection with other planets. He, he must have been thinking about the, pecu the peculiarity of the fact that this force is acting on other bodies which demonstrably must have such a force of their own. And so the idea that you know, if you can extend the Earth's gravitational power toward Jupiter and vice versa, then the fact that you're comparing bodies, all of which have their own gravitational pull, might have been part of what suggested to him the idea. Well, that's there in the second version of De Motu, but of course there's nothing about masses or the third law there. And that's right. a further step. That Jupiter and the Sun are interacting is a different claim than they're interacting in accord with the third law. By the way, just to make clear for everybody, I'm the one who presented this, and I guess this is my preparation, but Craig and Rob and I have been working one way or the other now for a few years, and they get an awful lot of credit for this talk. That's great. Question? Go ahead. Um, so I'd like to ask you something that uh, I really should be posing to Howard, but um, uh, it's here in your presentation, so I'll ask you. Um, the, in the 1990-91 paper, so he says, uh, <coughs> he points out that, that given the widespread view that one body can act upon another only by contact, that it was uh, far-fetched to apply the, the, the law of this way. And, and that's how people reacted to far -fetched. Sure. And, but what I'm wondering is, would it, would, it, was it, would it have been impossible to think that one body acts on another um, in, in, in these cases of gravitation? Indirectly, by means of contact with other bodies. Oh, that's surely what Euler thought. Okay, so then Euler knew Jupiter and Saturn were interacting. He was trying to get, derive the precise interaction from Newtonian gravity. 
But he did not think <coughs> it was action and it is. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So I'm just trying to understand, like, how much of the um, uh, of the numerator was sort of there because if you if you imagine some indirect in, indirect interaction between the bodies, then say you know for example the sun is acting on some local body which in turn acts on some other bodies which in turn act on say the earth for example, um, and as a result the earth is being driven towards the sun by some amount, then you might expect that that the sun is 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 also therefore is acting and therefore being acted upon at least as much, maybe much more because of the inefficiency of interacting with the mm -hmm. body. Well, I don't know how he thought. The first sign you see is in the manuscripts I showed. But as Bill Harper will support me on this, um, Huygens' reaction to the Principia was not only to categorically reject particle to particle gravity on the grounds there's no possible mechanical mechanism that could do it. He also said he very much questions whether the planets are right. At all. Yeah. yeah. He did not flatly 